Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, June 12th, 2012, and our special guest is Jonathan Finkelstein. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate the invitation. Really delighted to have you here. I've been looking forward to this quite a bit. Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, and express appreciation to Blackboard Collaborate for the use of this service. It is the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0. This is a lot of fun. Classroom20.com, a social network for educators using social media and Web 2.0. Closing in on 68,000 members, doing lots of um, really exciting things, including uh, a program with PBS NewsHour and a book, which <laughs> many are patiently waiting for the chapters to come out. We had 160 submissions for the book. Very exciting. I'm told it will not be long. If you're going to the ISTE show, that is the uh, annual big ed tech event for K-12 this year in San Diego, don't miss ISTE Unplugged. That's our full set of crowdsourced activities, including the All Day On conference, which used to be called the Jublogger Con and now called Social Ed Con on Saturday. They're all free events. Um, it's the unplugged.com. This year, for the first time, we're having this brilliant after party on Saturday night, uh, sponsored by Steady Blue and Startup Weekend EDU. So, and again, all of this is free. It's the unplugged.com includes the uh, Bloggers Cafe, it's the Live. If you've never presented before at ISTE, we have a way for you to do so. Our social learning summit was a great success. Thanks to Discovery Education, those recordings are posted, sociallearningsummit.com. Uh, Seventy some odd sessions over the course of six hours, all on social learning. Coming up this fall, our Library 2.012 conference, Future of Library, sponsored by San Jose State University. That's October 3 to 5. Should be 150 to 200 sessions. It is really a great event. The Global Education Conference, of course, is the flagship activity, five days, 24 hours a day, four to 500 sessions. It's just a blast. Global EdCon or GlobalEducationConference.com. Um, again, these are all free events. We encourage you to come and participate. Coming up on the Future of Education next week, we talk to David Preston, who will be bringing a class of students in to showcase a unique program he's doing. Marcia Kana talks on her book, Social Learning. Uh, Elliot Washer from Big Picture Learning comes on on the 17th. John Edelson to talk about learning any portfolios on the 19th. We've moved the CEO of Skillshare to the 24th of July. That was to be this week, but it's coming up. Michael will be on July 24th. New on this list, new and, new and or fun, Lee Rainey from Pew, Roger Shank, Paulo Blickstein from Stanford. Uh, Gordon Dryden from Australia, Tony Wagner from Harvard, Ron Walk, uh, Angie McAllister uh, is going to come on. Uh, she's with uh, Phoenix University, and they run what they say is the largest educational social network in the world, and has, she has some really brilliant things to say about learning analytics in the context of what they do. Uh, Pat Frang is going to talk about John Holt and homeschooling. Jamie Volner is new. That's uh, Schools Cannot Do It Alone. Bob Glinner is going to uh, preview portions of his new film called Schools That Change Communities. Um, Kirsten Olsen on <laughs> a great sounding book, Wounded by School. And Blake Bowles, this is new on his new book, Better Than College. Anyway, lots coming up and lots more in the hopper. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded in full Blackboard uh, versions and an MP3. Last uh, week we heard from Christine DePaolo and the I Am Student um, uh, Profile Branding Project that they, she does. We had five of her students on to go through uh, that program. It was really fun. Ruth Seeley talked to us about opensource.com. Uh, Khalid Smith and his wife Nicole Tucker Smith talked about entrepreneurship and education. Anyway, lots there, including probably of interest to Jonathan. Elizabeth Merritt came on and talked about the future of museums, and my guess is that you connect with her, don't you? He says you do. He's in the chat. Yeah. Fun. Okay, this is your chance to let us know where you're participating from. To the left of the whiteboard, look for the star icon, the second one down. Double click on it and click on the map. Feel free to post in the chat. 
time, temperature, anything else. We recognize this is sort of end of school year. Many of you may end up listening to this in recorded form, but those of you who are here, we really appreciate your being here. Okay, we're North America centric tonight. So for those of you who like to follow the chat, um, you can actually pull that window out. If you click at the top of the window and drag, it will pull out and then you can expand it and you'll often find it easier to follow the chat that way which I'm myself doing at this moment. So Jonathan, um, what conference did you and I meet at this year, or this past year? That was the 10th uh, anniversary of the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report, uh, which was down in Austin. So that's so funny. I'm really glad that you remembered that, uh, because I've had two or three guests on, including Elizabeth. Uh, from the, um, what's the name of her organization? Future She's Museums? from the Center for the Future of Museums, which is part of the AAM, the American Association of Museums. This is a terrific connection. I'm really glad that you have it, and uh, we'll be talking about that. Okay, so you and I did a little bit of a back and forth in email with regard to the topic of tonight's show. Um, I really want to drill down on. Uh, kind of webinars, the changing nature of professional development, um, communities, and sure. you really want to talk about badging. So our compromise is that we'll start <laughs> out with my topics and finish with yours. Is that okay with you? That's fine. I'm I'm very happy to do your topics, and uh, and if mine happen to get woven in, that is fine too. Whatever, wherever your conversation, your questions lead is good. Well, you're you're generous and gracious. I, I'm looking forward to the badging conversation because you and I, I think have different opinions. You've done a lot more work in this area, but I'll look forward to to talking about that. Can you tell me a little bit about your own history? Mm -hmm. Your bio says that you are a co-founder at Horizon Live, now Blackboard Collaborate. So, so tell me uh, what that was and how it started and who was involved. Oh, well, sure. Um, well, I, I, this was my uh, my second job after college. I decided it was uh, time to leave uh, Boston and Washington where I was working and move to New York. And I met up with a uh, a group, a small group that was one of the first major um, web media groups in um, out of New York, doing when, uh, taking websites beyond just billboards and, and and glorified brochures, truly doing interactive things in the browser. This was in the uh, as my colleagues like to say, uh, before the turn of the century. So this was in uh, the, the late 90s. And um, uh, teamed up with a group that had started a project there that was actually a training tool to do real-time online instruction internally at a big Fortune 500 company. So they were trying to turn their intranet website into an interactive collaboration tool and uh, realized they were onto something and perhaps there was a future in that business. Uh, this was right around the time that uh, WebEx was getting getting uh, going using the telephone. Uh, we were getting going using voice over IP, trying to pull together a collaborative experience that was co completely in the browser. Um, and indeed, that was the that was the beginning. Um, and uh, and Horizon grew out of that, uh, and uh, I grew with it for a few years. And uh, then went on to found Learning Times in 2002. So I do want to find out more about Learning Times, but because I worked for Illuminate and then Blackboard Collaborate for four years, um, I I'm just personally curious as to the history there. So is there anybody that I would have known at the time that it was Horizon Live? Well, well, I remember I I, I started Learning Times. This is our 10-year anniversary. So I have to think back to who was there 10 years ago uh, when I left. Um, um, but uh, my 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 uh, my hero uh, back uh, back then at the company was Steve Cannon, who was the uh, chief engineer and was really uh, uh, just a very uh, innovative problem solver and uh, and thinker. Uh, he's probably the 
kind of the 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 main the main carryover over the years, and I'm not sure what. He so that's really think. interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, we don't need to do it now, but I'm I'm actually still kind of intrigued. and would love to know more of the history of that. So ten years ago, you started learning times, and uh, t tell us about that's learning right. times and tell us about squirrels. <laughs> Well, I can do it in the, in, in the reverse order. We could start with the squirrels. Uh, but uh, it was also about 10 years ago that I was sitting in a similar position at a seat uh, in front of a computer uh, with a group of people in, interested in education who were logged in for one of the first online keynote sessions that a, an online conference called PCC um, had invited me to speak at. And this is a conference we've been involved in for I don't know, the last 15 years, I guess, at this point. It comes out of the University of Hawaii. And uh, I was talking about the power of uh, and the intimacy of the human voice and how we could uh, enliven the web with our own presence, not just with our words, and uh, asking people if they could think of a time in their own learning experience when something became crystal clear, when their choice of career suddenly became obvious, when a new hobby blossomed. Um, and I asked people to think of that as a learning moment and could they share it with us. And you could all try this right now if you like in the chat box. It's just like uh, just like it was all those years ago. Uh, so go ahead, try it. What's a learning moment that it was a very powerful learning moment for you, no matter how far back you'd like to, to think about it? Um, who did it involve? What did it involve? Where were you? Go ahead and try it in the chat box. You can let us know. Um, something that influenced the course you would take with your life or your hobbies or your interests. Uh, I was doing just that, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you will share. When uh, somebody logged in and said that chasing squirrels with <laughs> that's that's a, that's very good to you um, that that's a, as much a testimonial to the power of communication on the web but more so to your the relationships that you build online and in fact somebody uh, said during during this moment many years back that chasing squirrels with his college advisor uh, was his greatest learning moment and I didn't delve into it find out why but um, there was, I, I just left it to my imagination that a lot of the best learning and the greatest moments that we remember sometimes happen in the most unusual ways and I thought it was a great uh, symbol uh, of, of, the, of our values when we moved in, in the work that we were doing with people online. How could we allow people to chase squirrels? And uh, yeah, so that became the mascot because like them, hate them, everyone has a story well, you about say squirrel, quite a lot of positive is. things about the squirrel on your website. So I, uh, meeting you was a little sort of a moment <laughs> of humility for me. I didn't really know that much about learning times, and I've considered myself to be um, sort of uh, accomplishing things of worth and value in this space. And, and I'm, I get about 100,000 attendees to my event in a year. And I sort of thought, well, wow, I'm really kind of riding high on the wave. And then I read through your material and I thought, I'm probably a drop in the bucket here. Can you give us some sense of the scope of what you're doing, the kinds of organizations, um, and, and how sort of powerfully active this technology is? Um, well, yes, and and um, and and there's there's a lot of work for for both of us to do in building community, which is I I, I equally felt humble talking to you, so it's very kind of you to put it that way. Um, but uh, yes, um, we 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 tend to focus on the events uh, work that we do on uh, working with groups that are trying to extend a sense of community, either with a group of people that. Um, have already forged some sort of bond, like in the case of Tufts University, they are uh, reaching out to their alumni to keep them close to the campus and uh, we're building uh, learning experiences that feel like you're going to office hours with, uh, with uh, a faculty member to keep people connected to their alma mater. And then you take groups like the Smithsonian, um, with, with whom we've been working for many years now. Uh, it started with uh, the first event we did was a, a multi day online conference on Abraham Lincoln. This was uh, his, uh, uh, this was the, 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 the um, uh, you had 19 museums all focusing their attention on Abraham Lincoln in a different way uh, and uh, we brought them online and we heard about Lincoln's Air Force. 
Anyone know what Lincoln's Air Force was? Uh, we found out about uh, Lincoln's uh, role um, in, uh, of course, in the in the Civil War, and we of course learned about his, his about history, but we also learned about art, and we brought in all sorts of interdisciplinary kinds of tie-ins. Uh, Lincoln's Air Force. Anybody? Anybody? Uh, what was Lincoln's Air Force? Um, so uh, so for that, we were reaching out to both uh, largely to K to 12 students, middle and high school students. Uh, uh, as well as younger grades, but also to their teachers for professional development, to meet with Smithsonian experts who, who spend time studying and uh, sharing and telling stories. Pigeons, no, close. Lincoln's Air Force was Lincoln deploying hot air balloons right off the mall in Washington, for that matter, um, to uh, do reconnaissance over the border looking south. So. Uh, Indeed, the first Air Force, you can do it in air quotes if you like, uh, could be attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Um, but these are the kinds of things we learn about and learn about from Smithsonian experts during those events. We went on to do things like a multi-day series of events on climate change. Uh, just wrapped up year two of a program called Shout, which is on environmental education, in which we work with Smithsonian educators, experts, curators, scientists, go to their facilities. I was down in Panama. We did some live webcasts out of uh, the uh, Borough, Colorado, Borough, Colorado Island, which is uh, the most visited island in the world for research by research scientists. And uh, a lot of people interact, ask questions, and we issued challenges to them so they could go into their own neck of the woods uh, and become researchers, scientists, artists, exploring the world around them in very much the same way that Smithsonian experts do. Those are just a couple of examples. I also do a lot of work with the New York City Department of Education, both in professional development and some really cool projects with students. You can flag that in case you're interested. I could tell you about online debate programs we've been doing for seven or eight years, and as well as some um, actually really amazing uses of 3D world technology. While the rest of the world has kind of crashed and burned in 3D world, we're still doing some really cool stuff with uh, with students there. So interesting. I'm I'm wondering if there's a lesson of any sort for us. And so I've been doing this now for five years, and I don't feel like you and I have really bumped into or against each other much. So does that say something about the um, opportunity here, the scope of opportunity? Does it say anything about the, um, is, is there a reason that we would not, that I would not have known more about you? And, and is change happening as fast in this arena as it feels like it is to me? It's a good question. I think it does suggest a lot about what's changed. I think that for a long time, the notion of doing something online, whether it be live or otherwise, was a bit of a novelty, especially the online conferencing and the live events. But everybody's got a WebEx account or a Blackboard Collaborate account or a, a real-time tool at their disposal. Um, I think it's similar to saying, well, we've both been to weddings and bar mitzvahs in the last 10 years, uh, or we've both been to even better into uh, virtual, into real physical venues and we haven't bumped into each other. I think that's the better analogy. Um, and so until we met in Austin. Um, so I, I think it means that it's been woven into the fabric of people's tool sets and the technology has largely fallen into the background. People come to people like you and, and me and, uh, and and do the kinds of things we do when uh, perhaps when they're thinking about the event planner who needs to come to the wedding. We only get to do some of these big high profile things once in our lives for for the everyday kind of context and perhaps going to someone who's uh, who does it every single day is a is a good you know strategy to make sure it goes off well. I always think when I have an event that's got a thousand people, even a hundred people. I say to myself, that's not just a one-hour event. There's 100 people on. That's 100 hours of productivity that are on the line when you're gathering everyone at 8 o'clock Eastern time on a, on a Tuesday evening. I feel like that is a very big responsibility. Um, when you're just having 10 people and doing a meeting, we don't always give the same attention to our colleagues and to smaller groups. Uh, but if you have a thousand people spending an hour online, you want to make sure that if you're taking that, imagine what what would go on in those lives and what kind of productivity could happen either in personal lives or professional lives. So I, I do really think though that um, that uh, that there is a differentiation now between an everyday any old event and then the larger kinds of conferences and events that you and I are involved in. There are some in. other things I think that distinguish what you and I do. And I'm going to put the, the U in all caps in the I in a, in a nice little lowercase I. Because I think there's a, there's a scope difference here. <laughs> 
but but I'm actually not contracting with organizations to run events for them. I've pretty much been creating events, and um, and my events are sort of packaged around a core idea of inclusion and participation. So if I have an event with 500 presentations, that's because we're doing very little vetting, and it's uh, it's about participation rather than consumption. And so I think probably in part we're you know we may be running different kinds of events. Now I don't know how much you've played in this area, but I feel as though every time I get an email from ISTE or some organization running a webinar that is for pay. I sort of secretly feel like I'm the disruptor, right? I'm the. Uh, I, I want to be <laughs> careful to be a thoughtful disruptor, but most everything I'm doing is sort of freely available to anybody who wants to attend, and is is largely about getting people to present as much as it is to get to attend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm bringing up with any luck uh, an example of. Coming up here, um, I mean, for example, all of the Smithsonian uh, events, all of the work we do with the U.S. Department of Education and the New York City Department of Ed, and uh, a lot of the library work we do um, is also open. And my preferred way of, of uh, doing these events is for them to be open and free and sponsored uh, if necessary. Uh, I I think that's that's um, that's the way it should be. Um, of course, not every event lends itself to being free and open. For example, if you're an alumni at an institution, it might just be for alumni. <laughs> it's something special that those people get as part of their relationship. Um, so there are obviously times when not, uh, when, when in context where it, it shouldn't necessarily uh, be open that way. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm I'm in, in your camp. I also think that um, there is sometimes a uh, a uh, there are sometimes ongoing work and relationships that need to be managed by people if it's not just a, a conference. For example, one of the things we've been doing recently, I'm going to take you, I'll say more about the site we were just on in a second um, as we come back to it. But here's a, um, an online conference we've been doing for uh, a few years now. We're moving into Museums and Mobile 5. Um, and this is a conference all about the use of handheld technology in the museum community. And one of the things that happens during this event is that there's a series of pre-conference workshops uh, where uh, people submit their mobile projects uh, for review by experts who uh, come from uh, the museum world. They look over their mobile plan, their mobile strategy, they give them feedback. It's a little bit more like an ongoing course in a way with some of the interactions that happen. And so parts of that event are um, are this sort of clinics, this pre-conferences. Parts of those events are are, uh, are, are for fee uh, for all the time that's involved that people are uh, putting into to building it. And then you have like a virtual expo and a free open day uh, where people can come either to the keynote or the event. So sometimes it's a hybrid, but it really depends. So I'm interested in the kind of change nature of professional development that, that online learning provides. I'm assuming you've read Disrupting Class by uh, Clayton Christensen and his co-authors. Um, Michael Horn's been on my show to talk about that book. But uh, would your experience lead you to agree with the, that that uh, adoption curve that that they believe uh, is being manifested in online learning? This is where Jonathan says uh, sheepishly, "Can you elaborate <laughs> on the curve?" He hasn't gotten to that chapter yet. <laughs> So uh, Clayton Christensen is a business professor at um, Harvard University, and he has a theory called uh, disruptive innovation in which a um, less fully developed product um, serves the markets that aren't being served by the traditional mainstream products, grows to a certain stage, and then sort of rapidly overtakes the mainstream product. So an example would be the PC becoming more popular than the or more more of a mainstay product than the mini computer. But for a long time, the mini computer makers could not see that that was going to happen. And he says there's this t a typical growth pattern that would indicate that it, the technology is going to disrupt. And so he looks at online learning. And without any real background in online learning, he says, we can see this typical pattern existing here. And, if, and this would indicate that online learning is a disruptive technology. And if so, 
uh, I think his prediction is that by 2015, half of all courses, uh, half of all classes will be online. I may be wrong about the actual date there, but it's something close to that. But it does indicate really, really rapid adoption. So is the, are you seeing that happen in terms of acceptance and use? Yes, and I, I think it's, uh, I, I, and this actually could be our, our segue into micro-credentials, I'm sorry, but it, it very well could be, um, because I think what, I think for a long time at the early part of this last uh, decade and a half, um, you know, let's say 15 years ago to 10 to even just a couple of years ago, um, the focus was on you know making the move uh, offline to online and um, in, in many ways mimicking exactly what was going on offline and in a, a number of ways, some, some really creative stuff going on. Uh, but I think the skill set and the, the sort of course literacy, the learning literacy, if you will, for people who were not trained as instructional designers, who were not trained as media producers, who were not originally trained um, as, um, as, as teachers, and uh, they might be subject matter experts, but it's been a field day for anyone who loves to learn, right? You can, you can learn how to edit, you can learn how to make movies, you can be a storyteller. There's so many ways to tell stories. Um, so, so, so when you, uh, when you kind of, first you start with the experts helping the teachers move online, then everyone becomes an expert. Then you start to take it all apart and reassemble it again. So I, I do think that in a lot of ways and in, in, in the way that musicians and other creative fields have a huge audience and a huge platform to share their creativity, so too does anyone who loves to teach or who has a, a subject matter expertise. So you're looking at these massively online uh, open courses and, and looking at uh, a lot of the startups uh, around uh, taking, taking subject matter experts that only a select few would ever have gotten to hear and of course taking initiatives like MIT and Harvard's. Um, and I think you are indeed right, 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 right where uh, Clayton Christensen says we are on that kind of a disruptive, disruptive curve. So you offer a training course, and you've written a book on um, synchronous teaching and learning online. I would have guessed that this would be a pretty significant growth arena as well. Um, are people looking for training in this area, or alternatively, should they be looking for it and they're not? Hmm. Good question. Um, it, yeah, it, it is, um, I, and uh, it's it's coming from unexpected and and great places too, in terms of where uh, where people are um, are finding us from. Uh, for, for example, I I just finished a um, a workshop, a, a two week version of my CSTP certified synchronous training professional program, which was with the U.S. Department of Labor, where they were. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Steve. Um, I, uh, I, uh, and and this is a group of people who are conducting online training, um, who are managing grant programs, who are reaching out to workforce development communities to encourage people to apply for their grants and walk them through the process. Uh, and they recognize that uh, they are online facilitators suddenly. And it's funny because not all of them would have been sent to or invited to training uh, for their face-to-face -face workshops, but somehow that move to the online realm is the trigger that um, that they and others need to say, hey, how can I reconceptualize how I talk to people in large groups in general? Um, <laughs> keep in mind, Gigi uh, and Steve, I, I, I'm so delighted that, you, um, that, you, that you've got the book. I, I'm, I, I wrote it. It's like what, it's actually my, a member of my, I'm, hi Jessica, uh, Jessica is here. Jessica used to be uh, at the publishing company that published that book, Wiley, but she is now with Cengage, Cengage Learning. Hello. So I have, uh, I have uh, a member of the original editorial team on hand uh, from that book right here with us. Um, and I lost my train of thought, but, uh, oh yes. So yes, I do see um, a, a, a sort of uptick in, in interest I think the more people have low cost access or free access to tools to do live events, and the larger those events get for people, uh, the more they seem to be interested in working in a community to learn from others who've done it um, so they can save themselves 
some pain, which is inevitable for all of us in these environments at any time to time. I, I, that was fascinating, your comment about this move actually precipitating training that might not have happened otherwise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mull that over because that would be a really interesting um, turn of events, I think. I'm also interested in the degree to which these technologies promote grassroots kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning. So for me, I'm seeing a lot of opportunities for because of the lowering of the cost of the technology and its increasing ubiquity, chances for educators to teach other educators without going through sort of traditional hierarchical structures. In, in your mind, how does that play out? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, where's the balance? Where's the balance? Hmm. Um, are you thinking uh, specifically in the context of a live online session? Yes, I, I am because it seems to me that kind of uniquely the live online session provides an opportunity at very low cost, both because of the technology and the lack of travel, for educators to create opportunities to teach each other that previously might have only happened at a very local level. Mm. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot to that. Um, I, I, yes, <laughs> I'm not sure where to go with it, but other than I, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, the, 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 I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to create communities of practice that they otherwise would not have thought to bring together. I love sessions. I sometimes say to people, you know, you don't need to go create a whole new, a whole big PowerPoint. You and I are doing an event right now with, with limited PowerPoint. We're just going to the web, having a conversation, looking at what our colleagues are sharing with us in the way of questions and comments. Uh, it's kind of like the faculty lounge at, at a university. It's it's like the cafeteria where you meet up with, with folks. I've gotten into a show recently called, uh, oh my god, what's it called? Um, not Third Rock from the Sun. What is it called? The one with uh, Jim Parsons. And um, um, I, I, it's on my DVR, and I know where to find Big Bang Theory. Thank you, Gigi. Um, I, I love when they're kind of just sitting in the cafeteria and talking. And of course, it's, it reminds me of when I was in, in, in college. But we don't need to always have a set agenda. We don't always need to have a set of PowerPoint slides. I love what you're doing here and what you've been modeling all this time with your series. Uh, and I uh, have a topic, get a guest. As my friend Greg Stevens from the American Association of Museums says, uh, you've got the barn, I've got the costumes, let's put on a show. I was uh, chuckling so hard I couldn't hit the talk button. Uh, uh, I've got the barn, you've got the costumes, let's put on a show. <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> I want to write it down. That, yes. That's uh, that's Greg Stevens, who heads up professional development at uh, which at AAM, which is the group where uh, that uh, uh, Elizabeth Merritt is associated with. That is really that's delightful. Right. Yeah, um, I I think there is something really spectacularly interesting to me personally about this moment in time, because of the that ability for peer to peer teaching, and I'm um, I'm curious as to how it seems like you maybe kind of bridge two different views. And I look at large institutions that are used to providing that kind of training and sometimes um, depending on the revenue from it and to now all kinds of activities that are kind of crowdsourced. And I've wondered you know, if you're in a traditional organization, say like an ISTE, who've been very generous about providing us with crowd space for crowdsourced activities, do you feel that's a threat? Um, my guess is that uh, they probably do. So, so Steve, do, do crowdsourced activities pose a threat to uh, to more formal, paid, structured the business model of doing events? That's what I'm thinking about out loud, because it would seem to me that they probably do. Yeah, I, well, I, I, they 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 may they do. Um, I think just as I think in, in any field, anything that is crowdsourced or or free is going to uh, is going to 
uh, force a uh, other business models to reconsider themselves. I'm working with lots of groups right now in the in the whole notion of micro credentialing and certification, who are thinking about what value uh, they bring. They've traditionally certified learning and some uh, traditional ways through assessments and tests and through the sheer uh, through their sheer identity of who they are and, and what they've represented and and now we're looking at uh, the possibility that uh, that other groups or breakaway uh, groups or startups are going to be credentialing or certifying um, and uh, indeed there it is that's badge stack that you're looking at on the screen right now um, and and uh, so I to me I, I, I certainly people can be threatened I think whenever they do feel that way uh, it's an opportunity to see how can you leverage what expertise you have and add it to that community effort versus retrench or declare your life over or just keep going at it even even as it's becoming a smaller and smaller part of anyone's life. So to me, those are the exciting times for anyone doing things. Is what can you learn from it? How can you join it? And how can you work with the community? So I'm going to give you a chance to really kind of drill down on this. Um, and, but before I do so, I want to give you some of my kind of hesitations about the badging concept. So one of my concerns is that uh, this becomes a fairly complex way of perpetuating a dependence on other people's assessments. Not just that it's a perpetuation, but it's actually a, a, a complication of that dependence. And I think about the value right now of the ability of an individual to actually manifest their value through a portfolio of their work versus external assessment. And I see that as being really, really valuable. And then I think about these, the concept of badging, and I think about the enormous complexity and the enormous number of badges and the degree to which that would be such a distraction and the, the amount of, kind of having to figure out who's issuing what badges and, and how, to, how to measure the value of those badges from somebody who's trying to assess the role or importance of someone else. It feels to me like it's actually moving in the wrong direction. Okay, so I've laid that out. And well, now you get a chance okay. to both argue back and kind of explain the richer nuances of what you're seeing. Okay, I would love to, to follow up though and ask you about what, what, would the, what is the right direction in your mind? Um. So uh, we have a 24-year-old daughter who graduated from university last year and uh, does theater for children with autism. And um, over the course of three or four years, I've worked with her to build a website to kind of document what she's doing in her work. And she's sort of proactively in charge both of her career and of the um, the degree to which she can manifest that through her website and through her work, videos and essays and the like. And I think about what that would have been like if she were um, going through courses and trying to get badges to manifest that learning. And it feels like that would actually have been a step backwards for her. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, the problem with, uh, with talking about badges simply as badges is that it's, um, it, the, the word is a, a proxy for so many different uh, opportunities. Um, for some, it is very much about the, the issuer. It's a way of existing organizations who either do have learning programs or institutions that have relationships with the community of people but have never given any kind of formal recognition or credit for the role that people play in those learning communities. Both of those groups on the we give credits now to the we've never thought about giving credits now approach. Um, and so so you can look at it from the, the issuer perspective. How do I give credit, build relationships, show my connection to the people that I um, am serving? You can look at it from the earner's perspective as well and the earner Many people are, are not extrinsically motivated by that. It's not to say some aren't. I didn't think I was until I took an online series of courses on programming and didn't even realize there were badges involved and started to see them showing up on the right side of the screen, not only showing me that I had learned something in the hour I had put in, but reminding me that I still had a bunch of grayed out things to earn. I'm a checklist kind of person when it comes to that stuff, and I actually appreciated 
um, the uh, the reminder of how I was doing and the the affirmation of of, uh, of what I needed to do. So you have you have on the the earner side. Um, I think you would find that most people are not ultimately motivated by the badge, um, but they may be motivated by what it means to them, either to their standing in the community they serve, to the prospects of future employment, um, as uh, as a recognition from the outside that the time they spend in, in, in environments that are not often or have not traditionally been set up to recognize efforts can now do so. We do a lot of learning. We do a lot of things that often go unnoticed. Um, people don't always get credit where credit is due in this world because because of those disruptive kinds of things you're talking about. And this is a way of trying to put a uh, to put a, a blue ribbon on some of those things. And then thirdly, you need to look at badges from the perspective of people who are interested in both the organization and the issue or the audience for these things. Um, and so if I am a prospective employer and I want to search like very much the way someone might search LinkedIn to find somebody uh, who meets their criteria. If I have a way of taking large skill sets and breaking them down into more granular portrayals, uh, representations of, of competency, I might be able to narrow the pool of people who I'm looking for. So people knew saw your blog entry, but they probably also already uh, were following you and you had a reputation that came from, from, from that work. Not everybody's work is so public um, and, is, and, and is so uh, well backed up with testimonials and, and, uh, and references in the same way. So I think, I think er you can talk about badging from many different angles, not just those three. There's so many other ones. So I think it's important just to, to, to before we you know, summarily decide that badges don't fit in one context or another, think about how or, wh or whether certain aspects of them could fit in a very specific context. I, I, I mean, I'm not as unconflicted as I sound here because I do really like this idea of, um, <laughs> like when we pick an orthodontist for our child, when they sort of voluntarily become board certified, that indicates a willingness to aspire to a higher level. But there was something you said that I'm going to really reflect on. Unfortunately, for me, it bolsters my position. But I already feel like the degree to which there's sort of this robo selection, robo winnowing process, right, that winnows down um, the applicants for a position by looking for certain things in resumes or, or the like, that already feels to me like it's a huge disservice to people who have a body of work that's of value that doesn't get trapped by some uh, system of easy external or extrinsic filters. And, and what I would want to convince someone is to not get involved in the complexities of badging, but to actually do authentic, valuable work and learn how to represent that. So if you've coded on a project or you've uh, helped to build a bridge or whatever it is, that you learn how to represent that in a way that, that's, that's richer than you know, some system for sort of arbitrary is too strong a word, but, but arbitrarily um, making it the job easier by reducing the number of applicants that you even that you actually look at things by. And, and again, I'm, the sheer numbers, the question in the chat was, you know, if a school administrator wants to know if you've pursued, pursued specific learning or skills, that feels like such a shortcut to me uh, because the administrators, gonna, they're not going to know out of the millions of badges which ones have value, except for the ones they potentially might be tracking. But it also sort of reinforces this idea that the, the badge reflects the learning rather than your actual accomplishments or achievements. Now, I've said my piece. <laughs> I'd like you to describe that stack, kind of talk about what you've done. I mean, you obviously have had some success here. And kind of give us an idea of what you're doing that's unique and valuable so that if and when I'm proved wrong, people will actually have a good sense of, of what you've done right. Okay. Well, yeah, no, I just, just one quick, quick uh, thought. Um, I, you know, right now you've got standardized tests. You have, um, uh, you've got grade point averages when you're dealing with people, you know, making the first cut. Um, you have Google putting up billboards that um, have, uh, cryptic problems to be solved, and if you can solve them, you figure out that it has the phone number you're supposed to call to get your interview. And people have ways of filtering through to find the people that um, they'd like to call in for that first step or for that next step. It's it's that there's there's a lot of people out there, <laughs> and we do need to kind of take that 
that first angle. And, and there's nothing that says that uh, uh, that the skills that are represented by a badge are, are any less legitimate than the ones represented by a GPA or any other arbitrary or not arbitrary uh, piece of data you'd use to make that first cut. Um, and it is possible that when you think about you know the work that that's in your your daughter's portfolio that um, I would love a situation in which there were, people would make it through the the qualitative richness of her of of what she has posted there um, and one would hope that would be the something that somebody interested in her would either do first or do after they saw a series of badges that talked about her expertise um, but anyway I, I, I just I don't think that it's mutually exclusive to other forms of of, of understanding people's skills and what they have to offer. Um, but I think we have it, we're not in a world anymore where you know plumbing. Um, you're not just a plumber. You need to know advanced refrigeration techniques. You have to know about all sorts of chipsets and in in particular refrigeration units. Um, you have to be retooled on solar energy and alternate energy sources. Uh, there's a there's a the universe of knowledge in any particular field is really deep, uh, and it can and there's skills that we're better able to assess because we're much more connected than we used to be. You used to just have a few people who knew you in in your work or your home life. Now you have people who know you all over the world uh, through the work you do and the contributions you make, and it might make sense to allow those groups to kind of have a say in in sharing a little bit about you in a, in a meaningful way to others as you get to, as they get to know you too. So um, badge tech, what is it, um, and what's going on? So um, we've been thinking as, as this is a really nice segue actually, Steve. We've been doing these online events, which for many people are labors of love. Their participation is voluntary for a lot of the work we do. People choose to take a day off or two days from the rest of what they're up to and come to an online event. Uh, sometimes their employer requests they go, but um, it's the kind of learning that hasn't traditionally been recognized, and it should be. There's both learning for the kinds of participation you do, there's learning for what you do and you share, there's le there is the recognition you should have for leading events, like you said. it's uh, For your events, it's really about participation and getting more people involved in sharing. So we've been doing that kind of work for all these years, and people very often have asked us, happens all the time. Do you have a certificate? Can I have a letter that says I presented or that I participated? Um, they're asking for a piece of evidence to, uh, to help uh, back up uh, how they spent their time. And um, around the, uh, this time last year, we were brought in to work with a group we've been working with for many years in the New York City Department of Ed to help build a digital literacy program for what are uh, at-risk uh, Students. These are actually 18 to 25 year old students who are still in high school looking to get their high school diploma. They're motivated in many cases in that they're there, um, but school and traditional learning has not been has not been a friend to them. Life has intervened for any number of reasons, and um, and so we were brought in to design the digital literacy program um, that would not only give them a computer after they took the course, thanks to the U.S. Department of Commerce and a broadband adoption grant, um, but also give them digital skills that would be transferable to uh, college or the workplace. And we thought this would be a great place to test out the work and thinking we've been doing with micro-credentials or badges. These are students for whom attendance is one of the most important issues. We've got to get them to stay in in the program so they finish the course. Um, and if we could give them quick wins and not make them wait four or five or six months to get a credit, if we could show that they were learning real world skills that were transferable to the to workplace environment or to school, they would realize they were collecting skills and competencies that no one could take away from them and that were not so hard to earn if you could break it down into smaller nuggets. And that's what we did, and the Dig It program was born, and the Dig It uh, is, um, was the beginning. And what we did was we, uh, we built it on this new platform called BadgeStack, and uh, BadgeStack has now been deployed at the Smithsonian uh, with Yale University for an social and emotional literacy train the trainer program across the, uh, the globe. Uh, it's uh, at work in museum settings and elsewhere. So we're really trying to give people a chance to recognize the learning that happens in communities and in non-traditional ways and to break down rather large, crazy, hairy learning uh, into smaller, more manageable pieces.
pause because of... And by the way, when... Oh, yeah, because... No, no, go ahead. Did I pause because I was trying to catch up oh, on the gotcha. chat a little bit, too. I didn't think you were expecting um, me to say anything, but I wanted to make sure. No, no, that's fine. I, I, people, I, I was on a soapbox there for a second, too. But, um, yeah, I, I wanted to go back to this uh, comment from Becky. First badge is then a rating system for badges. It's getting complicated. Becky, this is what's really interesting to, to me, is you have groups who traditionally haven't given any kind of formal recognition of learning who are thinking about what they can do to recognize learning. And then you have uh, groups that have been in the fee in the business of giving out certifications and giving out uh, and uh, whether it's two or four year degrees or professional accreditation licensures and so forth and they're trying to see how can I break down what I do and recognize either some of the less formal stuff we do or uh, or break down these largest certifications into smaller pieces. So they're both digging a tunnel towards the center place, right? Formal is getting less formal and less formal is the more they think about what badges can do. It's funny, the more they start to recreate the existing assessment systems and the existing certification systems. Um, but I think that this, 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 this middle area is going to be some, a happy place for both of these kinds of groups. Um, and that's, that's what I'm really excited about with the conversations I'm happy, having. Certainly no lack of diversity of opinion here. Which is what's, which is what's great. Yeah. <laughs> this is really going to be a fun thing to see play out. Um, did, go ahead. And by the way, about the e-portfolios that, that Renee mentioned, um, one of the things about badges that's really worth mentioning here is that every badge is backed, can be, it doesn't have to be, but in our case is backed up by a piece of evidence. What people are doing when they're earning their badges is building a new portfolio. Every badge you earn in a badge stack site is, um, has, a, has a, a, a body of work to back it up. So the e-portfolio is what came first, not the badge. And if anyone wants to click on that badge, depending on the badge owner and issuer, you can go ahead and actually see the portfolio that lives behind it. And that is, I think, very important. And then being able to surface the portfolio first, even before the badge, uh, is, is also a powerful part of this whole ecosystem. I'd really love to see an example of where you feel like this is working. Can you take us there? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, I don't you have to log in, see. though. Well, I can use app sharing for you. Is that okay? Absolutely. And then um, I can take... Yeah, let me uh, let me head over to a to a site, um, which also I have to be mindful of logging into a site where I don't betray anyone's privacy while logging in. So let me just give that a quick thought about where I'm going to take you first. <clears throat> I'm logged in as a uh, as a student here in the Digit program, which is the original Badge Stack site. This is a big student, so you can uh, you can just get a get a feel for it. Um, but what you wind up with, and this is this is really interesting. Uh, traditionally, online learning management systems have been focused on turning in your homework and uh, and perhaps getting some comments back. Uh, the way a badge stack site works is it, it is a community. The work goes through an iterative process by an expert, a reviewer, an instructor, looking or peer looking over your work, giving comments, encouraging you to improve it, and then finally approving. Uh, the work that you do, at least on the skill and competency front. And so what happens is uh, you've got 79% of the 5,000 kids in the New York City Department of Ed program self-reporting that their writing has gotten better uh, and that their confidence in their own work has gotten better through this process, uh, a, a process that is very new to all of them, including the teacher, this hybrid learning environment where there's a, a, an incredible mentoring relationship going on back and forth. So you have writing improving, you have confidence improving as work is reviewed behind the scenes, and then as soon as it's approved, being published for everyone in that community to see and learn from. You've got some people saying, I don't know if I like that. I, people can copy off each other, it's too transparent, it's too open, uh, and, I, and I 
currently I'm still pushing back a little bit and saying that's what learning a community is about. Um, let people. I do this during my real-time events. I do something called a solo fishbowl. I can actually demonstrate it on the whiteboard in a moment, where people get their own quadrant, their own square on like a tic-tac-toe board in the in the whiteboard. And I have an assignment where they're all working in their own box, but you can see what everyone else is doing on the same screen. So you're working independently, but you can still see what everybody else is up to. And so you have two choices: you can be unique. Um, and look around you and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this a different way. Everyone else is doing it one way. Or you can be inspired by what people are doing. The direct copying is, is easy, and that's obvious, and it's laid there. Um, but those two other things are nice, being inspired or breaking out and trying new ways. So we're seeing that happen a lot, where people take a look first and, and see how... Um, uh, I'm going to actually take you to my CSTP, my live online community, which is a badge stack site. Um, sorry, I didn't really show you anything while you were in there, but I just had an idea about jumping over over here, so we'll just go with it. Um, so um, let me just hop over. So this is what I call my ideal library. I've been doing this for the last six or seven years. When people take, thank you, Jessica. When people take, uh, when they take my course. I've always asked them as their homework assignment is to submit a, a, a facilitative uh, synchronous idea, a lesson plan or strategy into the idea Dropbox. And over time, uh, the Dropbox just keeps growing and growing and growing and you can sort on topics like show me things that relate to closed captioning or things that relate to using the participant profile or the chat uh, or maybe particular uses like icebreakers or mini lessons or role plays or scenarios and you can go ahead and, and search for these things. Um, so what, what's, what's, um, uh, where are the badges and where does this kind of play in? So people have to actually, uh, submit an activity after every synchronous session. They have a choice. I give them a choice of quest. They have to do, here is one more focus on using the whiteboard in, a, in an innovative way, and they have to come up with an innovative use of a pre-prepared backdrop, a little video clip you watch for an example. Then they have to submit their, their own idea. Is it a game? Is it a simulation? This is a quest. This is something you have to do in advancement of earning badge. So you submit your idea, uh, give a little self-reflective piece about it. And then Jonathan, as the host of this particular event, can look and see that he's got some submissions to review. I'm the expert, the reviewer in this particular case. I can look through the submission from these students. These came in today, yesterday. I have to look over them for my current course. And then when I approve them, uh, in this case it requires me to approve them. It doesn't always have to be that way. Um, but when they get approved, they then show up in the IDEA library where they're available to everybody else to search. And, and so what we're doing here is we're building community. Um, we are building community one idea at a time and we're doing it in a structured way in a way where this work would usually just kind of get relegated to a discussion forum, lost, unsearchable, unsurfaceable. Everyone wins here. If there's 20 people in the class, one idea comes in, 19 people get 20 ideas and out of it. Um, so this is working really well. <laughs> this is now as a library of about seven or 800 ideas, and you have people who are now earning badges for the work they do in here. By the way, I should mention it's also really helping in building community online in our discussion forums. One of the things that's happening here is that people can nominate each other for, uh, for great ideas, innovative thinking, things that are happening in the asynchronous discussion forums. And, um, you can actually, I'm in here as an admin, but you can actually nominate people. Um, you can set thresholds and say that only five people think this person is an innovator. That's the threshold. Um, I can create triggers and rules that say you have to have already proven yourself in some peer-reviewed or some instructor expert-reviewed way before you qualify for some of these other activities. So you can really, um, essentially, with a, a graphic user interface, create some pretty amazing algorithms as to what constitutes achievement. Okay, I'm take a breath. <laughs> We're two minutes away from finishing. We always finish on time as a courtesy to everybody involved. So sort of your final two-minute wrap-up, <laughs> what do you want to make sure we take away? Well, on the live events front, I would, uh, I, I, I would simply say that there's room for, for everybody in the live online world, but if there's one thing that's very important to me when I do a live online event, and you do this beautifully, Steve, is I think about what's the why am I asking everyone to be here at a particular time? If it's not about a conversation, if it's not about unpacking an issue, if it's not about a sense of choice or empowerment, 
um, it could probably be recorded and watched or enjoyed in some other fashion. So always think about why and who, what's the motivation for people being there. The same thing seems to apply in the badging world as well, and this gets to the, the great um, points and, and, and concerns you raised about, uh, about uh, serendipity and about qualitative uh, development. Um, if, if you make it too rigid and you squeeze all the fun out of learning by sticking a badge on everything, it's going to be really hard, just as hard to find the, uh, the needles in the haystack uh, as it was before. We're going to squeeze the fun out of it. And, and I think you, you need to be critical about where badges get applied as well. I'm very determined that when badge-based programs get introduced, they not be introduced as badge-based programs. Badges are the little side benefit that comes for doing something you love or you're motivated to do, and it's the little extra piece of recognition that helps an organization let people know that they're valued. Um, it's usually not the leader, um, but it is a way to, to tap into the amazing morass of learning that's happening among all of us and kind of bring a little bit more meaning to it for others. Jonathan, I'm really glad to know you. Uh, I think, in fact, that we disagree. It actually maybe even makes the relationship a little bit better for me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, again, we do want to finish here on time, and so we really appreciate uh, those of you who have attended. Thank you for, for being here. Thanks for the good questions in the chat. Uh, don't miss David Preston next week and Marcia Connor. Uh, actually, that's not next week. It's the week after. I'm going to be uh, at two different conferences next week, including SD. Um, so we have a little bit of a break now. But Jonathan, thanks so much. Yes, Steve, thanks for all you're doing and building community and, and making sure it's open and transparent for all of us to be involved in. And I've lost a picture of you. There it is. Okay, I'm going to look forward to future conversations. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Sure glad you attended and, and were here with us. Take care and bye. <laughs>